Hi, welcome to the monthly Refuah Nefesh Live conversation. My name is Dr. Ariel Mintz, and I'm the Executive Director of Refuah Nefesh. Refuah Nefesh is an organization dedicated to discussing mental health in the Jewish community and reducing the stigma, as well as providing support for people that are affected by it. Before we get started, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Jenny, specializing in custom-made jewelry and excelling in customer service. Um, they have sponsored this event, and we thank them for that. And you can learn more about their company by visiting johnnyritz.com, J-O-N-N-Y-R-I-T-Z.com. Today, we are privileged to have with us one of my personal mentors and a foremost expert in the field of psychiatry, Dr. J.J. Racimus, MD, PhD. He completed his psychiatry residency at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and completed fellowships and consult liaison psychiatry, critical care-based medical toxicology, bioethics, and clinical research. He has also obtained board certification in addiction medicine and is a fellow at the Academy of Psychosomatic Medicine. He is currently the director of consult liaison psychiatry at Hennepin County Medical Center in Minneapolis, is an associate professor of psychiatry and emergency medicine at the Penn State College of Medicine and the University of Minnesota, and teaches psychoanalytic psychotherapy for the Minnesota Psychoanalytic Society and Institute. We will begin with a half-hour conversation between Dr. Stevens and myself regarding delirium, and then we'll begin, I'm sorry, it looks like we're having some te technical difficulties. We'll begin with a half-hour conversation with Dr. Stevens and myself regarding delirium, and then we'll take viewers' questions, which could be posted directly via Facebook comments or can be sent anonymously to info at refuathanefesh.org. That's I-N-F-O at R-E-F-U-A-T-H-A-N-E-F-E-S-H.org. And just give me one moment to get these cameras working. Hey, hey. It looks like we have it looks a stream, like working, we had a stream working now. Dr. Seema, thank, 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 thank you for joining us tonight. tonight. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Welcome, welcome. Tell me why you decided to, decide to speak about this topic. Well, delirium is a syndrome that looks like mental illness, but it actually shows up in people who are physically ill. So in some ways, it's much more common an issue, an issue with medical and medical implications and lots and lots of different places, not just in psychiatry. Okay, okay. You know, as we, you know, were, as advertising we were advertising this live conversation, conversation, we got we feedback from those people that they actually didn't know what delirium is. Maybe you can start by telling us a little bit about what this condition is and why people should be concerned about it. Sure. You know, it goes by a lot of different names as you're walking around the hospital and listening to people talk about patients who are struggling with delirium. So that could be part of that confusion, too. But let's just start with the basics, and then we'll build on that from there to make sure that we all have kind of a basic understanding of what's going on. So the way delirium works is, it's good to think about the starting point where our bodies really do a lot of work to make sure that our brains are working fine and kind of defend our brain against all sorts of stresses and things that happen. So that means when a physical illness affects thinking or behavior or things that look like mental illness, we really need to take that medical problem seriously. And in fact, the illnesses that cause delirium are always potentially life-threatening and really need some serious treatment. Interesting. And so is this a physical illness or a mental illness? You know, it looks like a mental illness because it affects people's thinking, their behavior, the way that they seem to relate to people in ways that are outside their normal way of acting and what's expected of them. And so in that way, it looks like a mental illness, but it's really driven by a physical cause it's just that psychiatrists tend to be sometimes better at finding it or recognizing it because the patterns of the problems are the things that psychiatrists look for more than the way other doctors are looking for problems. So even though this is considered more of a physical illness, it falls more under the domain of a psychiatrist to diagnose and treat than, let's say, an internal medicine doctor. You know, it's always my hope that doctors across lots of different specialties are at least capable of a 
a basic recognition that something that looks mental might really be a physical issue, but they often ask psychiatrists for help if they're struggling as to why the situation looks the way that it does. Okay. So now we know a little bit, you know, why delirium is important. Um, but can we go back more kind of to the basics of what delirium is and how you might be able to spot it in someone if they develop delirium? Sure. So I think a nice way to think about it is this. Let's start with a metaphor that, that kind of relates to what a lot of people know about general medicine. Most people have heard about problems like acute heart failure or acute kidney failure, right? The idea there is that there's an organ that we expect something of. The heart pumps blood around the body. The kidney filters the blood to make sure that it's delivering what it needs to from different organs. Okay, so obviously that means if there's acute failure of one of those, it's pretty obvious we know what's going on, right? The pump's not working or the filter's not working. Well, actually, if we think of delirium as acute brain failure, that's really a good starting point because, well, what do we expect of the brain? We expect the brain to help us to stay awake, pay attention to important things, remember what's going on, make sense of the world around us, um, make choices about what to do next, how to treat people, how to respond to them, make sense of language. All those things are actually their brain functions. And so people who have delirium often have something wrong with that whole collection of stuff that we rely on the brain for. And that's that's a really good way to understand what delirium is in a basic way. Interesting. So if we're comparing this to acute brain failure, and this may be a silly question, but is it that the person is brain dead? That's a good starting question. You know, they're not brain dead. The, I guess if we extend the metaphor, here's a really good way to think about it. People whose hearts stop completely and can't be revived because the tissue absolutely will not do what it was supposed to do ever again, then that's a heart that won't keep going and won't keep the person alive. Brains can reach that point, but someone who's delirious does not have that problem. All of the structures are actually alive. They can work just fine the way that they've been expected to, but something in the body is hijacking them. Something in the body is getting in the way of them doing things the way they're supposed to. So it's a brain function problem, but the brain isn't actually broken or on the brink of death or anything like that in that condition. We just have to take the disease that's caused it very seriously to make sure it doesn't progress and make things worse. Okay. And so then is it very easy to spot when someone has delirium? Does everyone with delirium look the same or can people have different variations of how they present? You know, they don't all look the same. And I would hope that people who search for serious medical issues would pick it up pretty easily. But it's not always that simple, like we said from the beginning, because of the overlap with mental illness and how it doesn't quite look like a standard medical problem. And you're right to ask, not all delirious people look the same, right? So one basic distinction would be some people have a medical problem that is just so overwhelming that when they get delirious and they have problems with their memory, their overall thinking, their understanding of what's going on, they also don't have much energy and they're just kind of out. They're very difficult to wake up. They look like they have very little energy. Some of them look depressed, actually, because they don't seem like they want to participate in things. On the other hand, there are people who get delirious from different kinds of causes that actually make them more likely to react to a situation, sometimes too much. Sometimes they'll lash out, they'll be scared, and they'll throw something at somebody or say something they would never otherwise say. And that kind of high energy state is also delirium. They both qualify. Okay. That's all very interesting. It's a lot. I know. Yeah. Going back a step, you mentioned, you know, that it's kind of it's physical causes yeah. um, that result in delirium, yeah. but not everybody that gets admitted to the hospital does develop delirium. So, so what is it? What kind of physical causes lead to developing delirium? That's mm. true. So although not everybody does, does get delirious when they get sick, you're right. There is actually a rather long list of things that could cause it. Um, this is part of the reason why we need to enlist the help of lots of different kinds of doctors to make sure we don't miss a cause because it can be the result of an overwhelming infection that finds its way into the bloodstream and is carried out throughout the entire body and, and even infects the brain. It can also be the result of mm, the heart not working so well, not pumping enough blood to the brain so the brain doesn't get enough oxygen and nutrient to function right. Again, you can see how the problem isn't really the brain itself, but 
in the way to do that. Sure. Do medications cause it? They can. So some of the medicines that we prescribe for mental health reasons, sometimes there can be a bad interaction and throw things off. Also, abusable drugs are a major problem in this area too. Uh, sometimes people will take too much of something that they wanted to just use for recreation and it overwhelms the body system to be able to tolerate it and then the brain can go offline in, in the way that we've described. Interesting. So both prescription medications but also illicit substances can lead to the development of delirium. That is right. And sometimes they interact badly with each other to create the problem. Okay. And can you give us an estimate for how commonly it does occur? Sure. So it's a little bit difficult to pick a number out of the air for everybody, say, in a society about how often it happens. But if you think about people who go to the hospital, for instance, for people who go to the hospital complaining of some sort of physical issue, if they get admitted, about a quarter of people who are admitted to the hospital at some point during the time there will have a problem with delirium. So that's a lot, right? Yeah, it's a pretty think, significant number. Yeah, think about a hospital maybe with 500 people, 125 of them at some point have this assault to the way that their brain normally works and the way they normally will behave and act. That's serious. So, you know, I myself haven't heard too many personal stories of people having delirium, but I know lots of people that have been admitted to the hospital. Is it always caught? It's not always caught. And not only is it not always caught, but because it gets in the way of the normal brain function of the person who suffers it, that sometimes he or she doesn't really even know what to say to kind of wave a hand and say, please help me over here. Sure. And then even after they've recovered and gotten out of the hospital, Sometimes they don't have a good memory for sort of how to understand what happened to them or what to make of it or even how to tell a story to describe what they went through. So those are part of the reasons why we, we don't always catch it. Okay. Okay. Um, and so you mentioned kind of a quarter of people, mm -hmm. you know, like admit to half or like a developed delirium. Yeah. Is that just random who develops it or are there certain people that are at greater risk for developing it? We, we have been able to figure out that there are certain kinds of folks who are more likely to have a problem. Like if you have the same pneumonia in person A and person B, there are some things that would distinguish them. Um, you want to talk about sort of what those risks would be or, or yeah, who sure, would be in more that? about those risks. Okay. So I think, again, a good way to think about the risks is to go back to that acute brain failure metaphor. If you're someone who is susceptible to getting acute kidney failure or acute heart failure. Usually the number one risk factor for that happening is having a starting point of a problem with one of those organs to begin with, right? So if you've had a heart attack before, you're more likely to have problems with heart failure later. Okay. Right? If some previous infection or a kidney stone or something like that has affected your kidneys in the past, you're more likely to have that problem again. So sure. it works that way with the brain. Right. So what would those kinds of things be? Um, having a head injury, um, having a disease from early on in life that affects the way that the brain is put together, like epilepsy or autism or intellectual disability. All of those things get in the way. What we used to call mental retardation is actually a risk factor, too. Um, and then the other things, um, one thing that, that might make sense as well from that metaphor way of framing it is, the older our brain is, the more susceptible it is to, because we lose our ability to adapt to stresses as we get older and as our organs aren't quite as resilient as they used to be. So age is a major risk factor too. Okay. So there are several predictors mm -hmm. of who may develop delirium. Yep. But is it predictable? Not in any one particular individual, unfortunately. The only thing that I could think of that would really be useful to know is if someone had an episode of delirium before that's probably a decent predictor for the person in question, but really nothing else tells us for sure that it'll sure. happen. And for that person who's had delirium before, is it only mm -hmm. a strong predictor if they're admitted for the same reason, or even if they get admitted for a different reason to the hospital, are they more likely to develop delirium? Actually, both of those options that you presented are true in their own way. In other words, if you had the same problem that you had the first time, your likelihood is quite high that you'll have delirium again. But even if the medical problem is a different one the second time around, the risk is greater than it would be compared to some other general person in the population. Okay. So we've spoken a lot about what delirium is and how we might, you know, who might be more likely to get it. 
let's shift our focus now to what maybe we could do to prevent delirium. Is there anything that we could do to prevent the development of delirium? Well, obviously we can't just automatically make it so we'll never get sick, right? So this long list of things from being exposed to a toxin, getting an infection, having a heart problem, having your diabetes get out of whack, these things just happen to people. So we can't prevent those things from occurring. But we can do things to try to avoid those risk factors, like doing things to stay healthy and defend our brains as best as possible in advance of ever having medical issues. Yeah. So what's good for brains? Um, regular exercise is good. Having a healthy diet that protects your vascular system so that you're less likely to have a stroke or have problems feeding your brain. Uh, if you have high blood pressure, doing a good job at controlling it, taking the medicines that are important to that, because having strokes is not good for delirium risk. And controlling your blood sugar if you have diabetes. Oh, and the one other big thing that we alluded to before is drug use. Okay. Staying away from regular use of abusable substances is important because they can cause lasting damage to the brain that makes it less likely to be able to, to sustain the stress of medical illnesses. So they're good prevention strategies for all of us. So, you know, take a step back, actually, you know, would you say that psychiatric patients are at increased risk based on the fact that they already to a degree have vulnerable brains, mm -hmm. they may have a higher risk of substance use, and with our second generation antipsychotics, they're more likely to have many of the risk factors you just mentioned, such as diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. Yes, that is true. And in fact, um, people who have a rather significant burden of mental illness they kind of close the gap in the age risk factor category. For instance, where we work together, right? At Hennepin County Medical Center, we see a lot of folks who have medical problems and mental illness in the background of their lives. They come into the hospital and delirium is a greater risk for people at an age where you wouldn't expect it as commonly. We see people develop delirium in their 40s and 50s because they have so many complicated things going on before they ever come to the hospital where their brains in some ways cope the way that somebody who is 70 or 80. Interesting. And mental illness is one of those pieces, plus, as you said, the medicines that affect them. Okay. Yeah. And so, so I mean, you mentioned age of the risk factor before, but so primarily are we seeing it in the older age group then, but just with some unique other population that are more at risk, we'll see it. I, th I think that's right. The unique outlier populations are folks who really have serious substance use problems. Okay. We see delirium in very young people who end up getting a drug on the street that they didn't expect or mixing it together with something that doesn't go well. But otherwise, most people who are delirious are, are older than that. Okay. That's true. Mm -hmm. Once someone develops delirium, what can we do at that point besides treating the underlying cause of the delirium? So it's good that you ask it that way, because um, even though psychiatrists are the experts, we think in many cases identifying it, we aren't usually the ones with the tools to really definitively fix it, because that underlying cause treatment is critical. But there are things to do to make it easier for patients and really their families and everyone else around them to get through the episode of delirium more effectively. As I was suggesting before, because delirium really affects the way people think and behave, you could imagine they would have a hard time participating in their own health care in that state, right? Sure. Yeah. So sometimes we need the assistance of family members and friends to be able to make basic decisions on people's behalf when they're having a hard time, when there's a major choice to be made about a medication or a surgery or something. So we definitely depend on assistance from family members and people who know and, and love patients suffering with it to get them through. So that's one key thing is just having people at the bedside who know that person and can sort of stand up for them or advocate for them when they're going through that hard spot. Wow. So beyond what doctors could do is actually, you know, the family members and friends could potentially have a greater impact than the doctors could have in, front, in reducing the length of delirium and helping them get through it. They really can. Okay. Yep. As you might have seen visiting friends or family in the hospital, doctors don't spend a lot of time in the room compared to the other people who are there. Nurses certainly spend more time, but sometimes family and friends are there more than anybody else. And so I think it's good if we talk about some of the things that family and friends could actually do for the person suffering delirium on an hour by hour basis in the hospital. So what are some of those specific things that they can do? Well, those familiar faces go a long way. 
right? So yeah. having that starting point in the here visiting you because you got really sick or you were in an accident saying that kind of thing regularly over and over again reminding people where they are is actually a really useful thing to do because they tend to forget as i said the syndrome itself gets in the way of their memory sure so although it sounds kind of simplistic or redundant just saying those kinds of things again hi tom this is your nurse coming in we met before her name is emily you know th those basic things to reorient your friend or your loved one to the situation moment by moment can actually really help. Okay. Because imagine if you were there, right, and you had been brought to the hospital after an accident that was very sudden. You hit your head on the steering wheel of the car or something like that. You don't even really remember what happened. The next thing you sort of remember is people are wandering by you with carrying around these strange objects. The lights are on and off, lots of noises in your ear. Not a lot of the situation makes sense if you don't sure. know why you got there in the first place. So having someone who remembers the accident and can say, two days ago, there was this car wreck, you hit your head, and this is why you're still stuck in the hospital and we've got a lot of recovery to do. That helps the person in the moment to not sort of freak out by all of the things that they can't understand. Sure. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Are there any medical treatments that you know, the hospital could provide? Well, you know, hospitals are starting to really figure out that the way they run their routines around people suffering from delirium is important to them too. Like, you know, we take for granted that we get up in the morning when the sun's coming up and we go to bed when the sun's going down. But again, you've seen hospitals. Sometimes there are bells and whistles going on at all hours. Lights are on at the wrong time. There's noise when you'd like to be resting. So hospitals are trying to do a better job of setting up their medical care routines around something that's a little more friendly. And those routines are helpful, you know, like watching TV or listening to your favorite music during the daylight hours, but then getting those things out of the way so that you can rest at night. So the, in a way, those are medical treatments too, because it's fitting the lab tests and the surgeries and all the other things around a normal human schedule can actually be really helpful. Sure. So that's good. Before we go further, I'd just like to, you know, welcome anyone who's joined recently um, and let you all know that we're with Dr. J.J. Racimus right now. I'm an expert on the condition of delirium, um, also known as acute brain failure, which will affect about 25% of people admitted to the hospital. Um, in about 10 minutes from now, we're going to start taking viewers' questions. If you'd like, you could send them either through our email address, info at refu.hanafesh.org. Um, or you could post them as a Facebook comment, and we will try to get to as many of them as we can. Dr. Asima, so, you know, we've spoken a lot about kind of the risk factors and, you know, how we might treat it once it's happened. But but what, you know, so you have the delirium episode. It might be scary for the patient. Um, but what about after that? Once they get better, once the family helps them or the doctors help them and they're able to get out of the hospital, the delirium result, are there any long-term consequences for them? You know, there can be. Um, and some of those people who have the greater risk profile for developing it in the first place are the same kinds of people who sometimes suffer after effects. Okay. Um, so when I think about those after effects, the first obvious one that comes to mind is related to age. People who are older, who develop delirium, actually have a fairly good chance of not ever having quite as efficient brain function as they did before it ever happened to them. We think of this as being a reversible situation where the brain that comes into it stops functioning normally, but then it recovers its function afterwards. And in general, that's true. But the older you are, or sort of the less resilient your brain is going in, the greater likelihood there is a number of weeks or even months afterwards Patients still might feel like, I don't know, my mind's not quite as sharp as I was used to it being. Or people notice that um, you struggle a little bit with tasks that you didn't have as much trouble with before. Like you could whip through the New York Times crossword puzzle and now it's an ordeal. Or those Sudoku puzzles don't quite fit for, for your routines and your morning coffee. You can't didn't get them done as fast. And some people have a hard time getting back to work and, and basic life expectations for a while. So it's not just a short-term nightmare. It could actually be really life-changing. It can be. And speaking of nightmares, some people actually come out of the episode with nightmares too. So you've probably talked about PTSD here in this forum before, I'd imagine, right? Uh, we haven't covered it yet, but we hope to in the future. Okay. 
So a lot of the audience I imagine has heard about post-traumatic stress disorder. We think about traumatic life events for some people really sticking with them and creating a syndrome that's characterized by anxiety, some difficulty being around people doing normal life things without being really on edge or, or frightened or just really struggling. It turns out that being medically ill can be a trauma too, not just being in war or being assaulted or being neglected, but even being in the hospital can be a traumatic thing that registers as a mental health stressor. And worse, delirium is an extra risk factor for developing it. So if you go through a really big, bad medical problem, but you're clear thinking the whole time through, you're less likely to have it be a PTSD starting event. But it, it can be, especially if delirium is part of the picture. Very interesting. So, I mean, if you're telling me that people are at increased risk for developing PTSD, mm -hmm. is this something that we could prophylactically treat or is it something that maybe we could see them in the office more frequently to see if they're going to develop it and get out of it? Good question. I wish there were prevention strategies that we had on the front end. Um, there are a couple of things we can do to help people with their normal sleep-wake cycles in the hospital to try to prevent PTSD from coming on um, because good sleep is important for good memory and a good sense of memory for understanding the medical situation is really helpful for preventing PTSD. So building on that principle, because delirium robs people of their consistent memory over time, one of the prevention strategies, again, family can really help with this, is to keep a record of what's been going on day by day with their family members in the hospital, literally writing it down and creating what some people have called an ICU or hospital diary. So they keep track of what's happened each day and you know the doctors who have come in and the developments and other things like, you know, Uncle Harry came and visited from out of town and he left you that balloon and those flowers over on your shelf. Those kinds of things that if somebody just looked at out of the blue, they would say, why are those flowers over there? Because they wouldn't know why they were sitting in the hospital in the first place. But if you can frame the story for them, they actually have a better sort of sense of themselves over time. And they're less likely to have a traumatic thing stay with them months later. It's really neat. Interesting. So the studies have shown that you know, we could reduce the risk of PTSD when, when someone who develops delirium by doing these diaries and other measures. We can. By filling in the gaps their brain can't fill in for themselves, we can actually help them to be more resilient during these difficult times. So it's not, it's not a disease that, you know, we have ways that we could try to prevent it initially. Even if it happens, you know, we have ways that we could try to reduce the length of it. And then, if, you know, we could also prevent this negative sequelae by really being on top of it. We can be. And if you're at all worried about your own family member who might have gone through a delirium or you're wondering how they sort of are bearing up after going through critical illness, it's good to tell the doctors they meet with after hospitalization that, you know, this was a really rough go. Could you keep an eye on his mental health? Could you see how his mood is? Could you see how he's feeling and functioning? Or if I tell you my dad's really not doing as well as I would have thought, even though the doctor said he's fine, he's recovered but something's not right, it's good to tell the doctors who see patients afterwards to keep up their, to keep a, a radar up for watching for these kinds of mental health problems that come on the back end. Sure, thank you for teaching us about all this stuff that's related to delirium. And what I really like about it is that it's not something you just have to hope you get a good doctor. You've really given us so many tools that we could use with our, our own family members, to help improve their health. You've empowered everyone to be their family member's best doctor and really help them get better. That is true, especially because, you know, friends and family really know the people in their lives better than the doctors who have met them because they have a history with them. Yeah. And so if you see somebody really suffering who you care about and say, he's not right, it isn't just because he's tired or because he has an infection or he's coughing. Yeah. I'm worried because he's not making sense or he's not who I expect him to be. That's something to tell the doctors and nurses about sure. because they should take it seriously. So you might spot it for them because you know them better. Absolutely. I'm always grateful when I get family help for that kind of thing. Sure. Okay. Um, I'll give everyone a few minutes to submit their questions. We'll try to get to as many as we can. We already have some coming in. Um, but before we start asking the questions, I'd just like to remind everyone that right now, Refuera Nefes is running a creative contest. Um, submissions can include anything from songs, poems, short stories, videos, Anything you can think of. Um, we have several prompts that are on the website. If you go to refuerhanefes.org and you'll see highlighted in red, creative contest on the top. 
Um, just 11 days left to enter. Um, there's some really great prizes. We have gift cards. Amazon device and more information about um, 11 days left to submit your art, your, your pieces, and we'd love to see them. We'll take the first question now. Um, someone wanted to know, are there any specific medications that professionals should be aware of? Any ones that interaction can lead to delirium more significantly than others? It's a good question. The first one that comes to mind for me is when people take antidepressant medications, almost all of the antidepressants that we have work on the brain chemical serotonin. Just about everything that we have available does that. It's also true that some of the stimulants that people can get addicted to work on the same chemical. Those kinds of drugs are methamphetamine, cocaine, some of these um, strange synthetic drugs you may have heard about like bath salts and even synthetic marijuanas, all of these drugs also work on serotonin. And so mixing those two classes together is one of the areas where we have to watch out for a problem. That, that's the first one that comes to mind. The other group that I would think about, this is a little harder to talk about in a simple way, but there are drugs that get in the way of our ideal memory function. And there are lots of different drugs that do this. Um, there are anti-allergy drugs that do this. There are drugs that um, help us with um, controlling bladder function. There are drugs that help with muscle spasms and stomach spasms, all sorts of different things. They, all these drugs also sometimes can get in the way of clear thinking and mixing too many of those together in the same person, especially in higher doses, can also get in the way. It, especially in older people, we try not to have so many of those drugs running around at the same time. Okay. And are there safer alternatives? Obviously, you've mentioned several classes of medications, but is there generally other alternative that you could use, or is it just if the person's sick and you have to choose one, then you just be more aware that delirium may develop? You know, there are probably more options than we think of to start with in medicine because we have the tendency to pick the things that we to regularly use or um, seem like the first line treatment for a particular illness. But it's important that we sort of step back and say, okay, I would like to treat this high blood pressure as best I can. Or I'd like to treat this allergy with the most powerful drug I can. But sometimes there does need to be a compromise and there are other options. And so if you're worried about your or your loved one's thinking or, or other things that might be related to medicines, it's worth taking that medication list into your doctor to have a conversation about what's necessary and what might be pared down. Sure. So would it be a general good advice, you know, start low, start slow? Definitely should be. And always ask, how essential is this drug and what it, what's likely to happen with me if I take it versus whether or if I don't take it? Because adding one more thing to the list just slightly increases the risk of having a drug interaction that could make things go the wrong way. So it's always worth asking before you sign up for any new treatment automatically. Okay. The next question asks, are there illnesses for which delirium is the first symptom? If so, what should people around the patient do? Hmm. This is a good question too. So there are some acute conditions where it may not be clear that there's something else going on. And then out of the blue, it's the change in behavior or thinking that really changes things radically. Uh, examples of that would be strokes, um, a major shift in blood sugar in somebody who has diabetes, um, exposure to a toxin, whether it be a, an abusable drug or maybe some other thing at the workplace or um, in one's home like carbon monoxide. So as you, you get the sense that as I'm giving you this list, these are all really acute onset kinds of things. Usually it's not the first sign unless it comes on real quick. And if it comes on really quick, the answer is we've got to take these particularly seriously. And so people around someone who gets delirious that quickly, uh, a call to 911 is worth placing very, very fast. And if there's more than one person available, it would be good to have one person stay with the person whose brain is not behaving very well and someone else make the phone call just to try to keep them safe and keep them from making a decision in that confused state of mind that might get them hurt even more. Like trying to run out the door or, or do something abruptly or impulsively and then
trip and fall and have another accident that creates another problem on top of it. Sure. So if we can have more than one person present, it would be great to have one person make that quick call and other folks be around to do those same kinds of reassurances that we talked about doing in the hospital before that are good for brain health in general. So it's not usually the first symptom, but if you see anything that looks like delirium or that they're acting oddly, you should call 911 and get it checked out right away. Absolutely, because all the things that can cause delirium, as we mentioned before, are potentially life-threatening, and so they, they demand treatment right away. Okay. okay. Let me pull up the next question here. Have any um, genetic loci or any genetic focuses been, um, any genes that seem to play a role um, that make you more likely to develop delirium or to have a worse outcome with delirium? You know, th this is an area where all of medicine is trying to get better at finding ways of predicting, picking out the people who need more attention and, and focusing treatment as best we can. Unfortunately, we don't really have much of that in the area of delirium. The only my, uh, sort of some exception that I could think of is that we do have some genetic markers for cognitive disorders, brain diseases, the kinds of things that produce an illness that then makes people more susceptible to delirium. But in terms of really predicting who's going to develop it, who's going to have a lot of bad consequences from it, we really haven't found any of those yet that really help us clinically, unfortunately. Okay. Is that something that's being studied? It is being studied. Mostly in terms of things like um, being in a high risk group. So if you're an older person who's going in to have a hip or a knee replaced, that's a group we really worry about because older folks are at greater risk and developing delirium gets in the way of recovery after a surgery like that. And we don't want to have people stay in bed and, and not be able to recover after you know a, a surgery that wasn't even really required in the first place. So those are the, the, the populations that we're really looking for predictors in. It's harder to predict it in unexpected events like those other abrupt onset things we were talking about before, but planning ahead for situations to prevent it would really be helpful. Yeah. So we're working there as best we can. Okay. We have another question. Uh, someone's asking for a take home message for viewers that are medical professionals with regard to delirium and also for family members. Um, what, what would be your message to them? What should they take out of this talk? Well, you know, I think the take home message for professionals may be the kinds of messages we give to people we meet in the hospital we work with. Like Dr. Mintz and I were on our service together a couple of months ago, and there were lots of situations where we wanted to tell the staff taking care of the patient, what you see in front of you is not just a behavior problem. It isn't a mental illness for which you should judge this person or take it personally that the sick person in front of you is getting in his own way or getting in the way of your care routines, it, it would be nice to send the message that in some ways this isn't about you, the medical professional. This is about someone whose level of sickness is, it, it, it's actually worse than your standard patient. Like if, you, if your standard patient with heart failure is someone you have a list of expectations for and things go a particular way, if your heart failure patient also develops delirium, I'd like to send the message to healthcare professionals that they take that person extra seriously rather than less seriously because their behavior is making them harder to take care of. We need to lean in rather than move further away from folks who have delirium because it's a sign that the situation is worse. And I guess I would translate the advice to family members in the same way. If family members are saying, you know, my, my cousin has gone through this stuff before, but previously he was always awake and talked to his doctors about what he was feeling and what he wanted. But this time he really can't even help himself or answer questions or remember what's going on. Family members, I would ask them to raise their hand more quickly and say, this is worse this time. Please take this seriously. We're really worried that something's different this time around. Sure. So for the professionals, you know, we spoke earlier about how there's many potential causes of delirium. So if they're going to have kind of, you know, they, they see something that might look like delirium, they're going to start working it up. How far do they go? Are they going to do the million dollar workup immediately? Or are there certain things that they should focus on to rule out first? Mm, that's a good question, too. So there is a shorter list of things that cause delirium that if they're not recognized quickly and 
we don't intervene quickly, sometimes the damage can be irreversible. Like with a stroke, for instance, if a stroke is what's causing that, the brain tissue that threatened and lost our chance. So there should be a short list of things that medical providers should take very seriously. And they include things like that. Toxins are also on the list. Um, blood sugar issues are on the list. So there, there's a shorter list they need to take very, very seriously in terms of not doing the whole million dollar workout. So the second part is attention to those few things that need to be fixed right away. Plus, looking at the kinds of things that come along with it. So one of the things I advise other doctors to think about is what are the other things that are coming along with this delirium? What, what are its bedfellows? Like if this person also uh, you hear has a history of drinking a lot of alcohol most days and then they've come into the hospital, obviously we don't prescribe a lot of booze. And so some people can be going through a withdrawal syndrome. And so hearing that history and looking at someone whose blood pressure is high, heart rate's high, they're shaking a lot, they're sweaty, and um, they're really hot, sort of twitchy and shaky, yeah. that kind of picture should suggest to doctors, oh, I, I don't need to work up every possible infection or look for 15 other causes. I have a fairly obvious one in front of me. Why don't I treat this the way I know how to treat alcohol withdrawal? and make sure that this doesn't get out of hand. And if it gets better, then they don't have to spend a lot of money or, or resources working it up. And there are lots of other patterns that go along with delirium sure. that medical professionals should be looking for. That's just one example. And so if they rule out all the real serious causes mm -hmm. and there's nothing that seems obvious that's leading them down any one path, mm -hmm. is it okay to let the patient just write it out? It can be in some cases, as long as we're pretty well reassured that the situation is not progressive. So. They can write it out with good, close observation to make sure things aren't getting worse. Because there are some things, actually, that people will heal on their own. Yeah. Sometimes doctors get wrapped up in being able to try to figure out and fix everything. And the reality is that people's bodies do a nice job of sorting things out on their own. Um, and so that can be the way that it goes. The only caution I would give is that sometimes the syndrome of delirium itself becomes its own problem because people get so confused, they, their energy is so sapped, their memory gets so impaired that they can't even participate in their own medical care, or worse, they actually obstruct it. You know, Out of confusion, they might pull out their IV line or tip over an instrument or fall out of bed or, or hurt a, a healthcare staff member because they don't know what their agenda is and they swat at them out of confusion. When that happens, even if we aren't sure about what the underlying cause is, sometimes a psychiatrist will recommend some of our medications to try to help the person to stay calm enough as they're getting through that process to try to recover. Oh. We have a question asking, why do you think it is? You know, psychiatric illnesses are pretty well recognized. The lay public knows about them. Mm -hmm. um, many medical illnesses that are common, especially 25%, you know, the lay public knows about it. Why is it that so many people have not heard of delirium if it's so common? I think it's because of the mismatch of where the problem is with what shows the problem, right? So as we talked about from the beginning, the majority of this long list of things that can cause delirium aren't things that start in the brain itself, right? So we have uh, tons of doctors and lots of specialties looking for their favorite class of troubles. You know, I listen to lungs and I want to know what's wrong with the lung and that's if the problem's in the lung, I will find it, I promise. But if the person has an infection brewing in their lungs, but they haven't really been coughing very much, they haven't been complaining about it, but the first thing that goes wrong is they start to get a little confused or they're not behaving quite right or not taking care of themselves. It isn't obvious to the lung doctor that that's where they ought to be looking for the problem. That mismatch between how the illness is demonstrated and where it really started is I think one of the major problems. And the other thing is that when people do have mental illness troubles, we usually expect that from people who are otherwise healthy, actually. If you think about you know, most of the people who have mental illness troubles in your life, close your eyes and think about that person who, who is that sort of hallmark of real struggles with mental illness. They're not usually someone who's physically sick and frail and, or often older. They're usually younger people 
who seem to be physically robust and a okay but just act in strange ways or struggle with really not being able to get by in life and that that mismatch is really hard for doctors to pick up sometimes sure. and maybe the rest of us too sure and then even when people develop the malaria and it's recognized mm -hmm. so then do you think you know people are saying i had a lung disease and it caused me to be confused and they don't they still don't give it that name of delirium yeah i think that's true too and we do see that there's sometimes an insensitivity to that lingering effect problem we talked about before you know like even if someone does have the courage to say, I know it was six months ago that I was in the ICU with the tube in my throat and all of this stuff going on, but I got to tell you, it still sticks with me and it's bothering me. Sometimes our automatic reaction is, oh, come on. Aren't you grateful that they saved you? You know, get back to life. And this is, this, you, you should be grateful for every day that you have. And it's not that folks aren't grateful. It's just that they realize they've been changed by the situation, but we don't often have the sensitivity right away to hear it that way. Sure. We have about 10 minutes left in this live conversation. I'll remind the viewers that if you would like a question answered, um, you can post it as a Facebook comment, or you can send it to info, I-N-F-O, at refuahanefes, R-E-F-U-A-T-H-A-N-E-F-E-S-8 dot O-R-G. Um, you could also use that email address if you have any suggestions for future live conversations. Um, or any questions that you'd like to pose to us in general, we'd love to hear from you. The next question Dr. Asimus is asking, can psychoanalysis or psychotherapy treat delirium? How so or why not? This is a good question. Um, it's hard for psychotherapies of any kind to be helpful to the individual suffering delirium in the moment that they are struggling or even during the much of the time in the hospital. It's difficult. And one of the reasons is because when your memory is conspiring against you, it can be really hard to make gains from talking something through and then getting some insight about it or making a change in one's thinking pattern. If you don't really remember what you were thinking when you chewed on the, the problem before with help of a therapist, when people really have come out of the ups and downs of feeling a little better, feeling a little worse, but really have their minds back online, before they're ready for discharge, a little bit of psychotherapy can be helpful there. Usually it's what we call supportive psychotherapy, and it's not that different from the kind of stuff we talked about with diaries, helping people to make sense of what they've just gone through and dealing with the emotional consequences of all that they've forgotten and trying to sort of have an integrated sense of themselves after what they have suffered with. Now, I will tell you that Sometimes what people will say or how they'll act in the middle of being confused, occasionally it's curious what you see. And sometimes I think it reveals some interesting things about their psychology. But I would never say that that's something that needs to be processed in the middle of the situation. But sometimes it tells me about how they feel about their family members or how they've been treated before by other people because they're sort of communicating their expectations or their fears unfiltered. And sometimes that does help me to figure out how to reassure them or their family members. But other than that, the kind of psychotherapies that really are helpful for this problem are the ones that we undertake afterwards okay. to try to prevent the PTSD, to try to deal with the, the potential depression that might come weeks to months afterwards. But so if someone's already in psychoanalysis, would it be helpful for their psychoanalyst to come and see them in the hospital while they're in an active phase of delirium? Would they be able to gain more insight? Do you think, do you think that's something that would be a really good idea for the psychoanalyst. You know, I wouldn't ask them to do it, um, assuming that there would be something really useful for the psychotherapist, uh, the analyst, to be able to be helpful. But, you know, if someone's in analysis, that's very intensive work where uh, a patient and their therapist are meeting multiple times, usually in a week. What I'm getting at is this is a very important relationship in this person's life. And so depending on what the analyst thinks would be the upsides and downsides of such a visit, that kind of visit might be helpful because this is a really important character in this person's life and experience. Um, and sometimes their analyst is more important to them than a lot of their friends or family who, by virtue of whatever sort of social changes in their lives, they're not as connected to them as they are to their analyst. Their analyst might be one of the most consistent forces in their lives. I don't know that I would say that it facilitates the analysis itself, though. So interesting, but more so just kind of the thing we spoke about before where family members and close friends can really help the outcome of delirium. They really can. Those familiar faces go a long way. Okay. 
Very interesting. <laughs> um, okay, let me, um, while we're waiting for the next question to come in, mm -hmm. um, I'll just let everyone know that our next live conversation is scheduled um, for April 22nd. Um, discuss her experience with perinatal depression. Um, and it seems like it should be a really great live conversation, and so I encourage everybody to tune in for that. Um, you know, as we're between topics here, I had one more thing that I thought we might have wanted to talk about. Let me mention as you're queuing up the next question, uh, talking about that overlap with, with mental illness and the questions about medications. You know, when it comes to trying to help people to defend their brains and, and do the best that they can to understand what's going on in the hospital. Psychiatrists have different choices for medications than other doctors often do. So when people are in the ICU, you'll often see them get a lot of medications that aren't really that good for thinking. Sure. And it's because they're necessary treatments in order to be able to get the other things done, in order to control pain or keep someone calm enough that they really don't move around much and... Um, tear open a surgical site. They can be in really delicate spots. And as psychiatrists, we walk in and say, gee, I really wish they weren't taking that medicine because I know it's not good for brain function. But sometimes it's necessary. Um, on the other hand, sometimes people will stay on other medicines for longer than we think they need to. And so if you're in that spot as a family member and you're wondering, you know, they've been here a long time and they haven't been awake in a while, do they really need X, Y, or Z medicine? Maybe you can even ask the teams to call a psychiatrist for help. We might make recommendations to give medicines that we use in psychiatry rather than some of the other meds in the ICU. And because doctors are so busy, they're probably not always, you know, noticing all these little details and thinking, how can we change up the medications? That is true. So it's helpful to have a team involved, and that's why we have the service we do at Hennepin. And, and most hospitals do have a consultant psychiatrist who can help out. We have a tendency to recommend antipsychotic medications more than any other class. Not because we believe, again, this person has a mental illness that's going to stay with them, uh, but often because we're trying to get the parts of the brain that are sort of hyperactive or reacting to the situation and causing some difficulty or fear or emotional distress for the patient to quiet down, to leave room for the thinking part of them and the memory part of them to sort of get back in the game and and balance things out. And so we find antipsychotics are the most helpful. I just wanted to mention that in case you see psychiatrists or other doctors using antipsychotics to manage delirium, you, the audience doesn't get the idea that this is some sort of statement about mental health or that it's a terrible medication choice because after all, the patient doesn't have a psychotic disorder. They have delirium. It's different, but that's the group we use. For professionals, is there any difference among antipsychotics or are all antipsychotics equal? Based on most studies of delirium, there really isn't anything that says these medicines are absolutely better than these other ones. But sometimes the clinical picture with all the other medicines that are also required to take care of the person, it is actually true that some antipsychotics might be a better choice than others in certain situations and not adding more of a side effect burden depending on drug interactions and things like that. But there are lots of different options and we choose different ones depending on the individual person's sensitivities and the list of other drugs that they have to take in for how long. So is there any clinical pearl you could give to professionals or it's really just case dependent and every case will be different which one you should go with? For the most part, um, I would say that it, it, there isn't a general rule that applies everywhere, but a couple of useful things at least to consider are not using drugs that are complicated or more dirty than they need to be. There are some medicines that affect lots of different systems all at once and other ones that are kind of simpler and cleaner and only do one or two things. Okay. In general, it's better to use that latter group that don't do as many different things so that we don't run into as many complicating possibilities. And then the other thing is in people who have a serious drug use problem or are in the hospital for an overdose, you probably don't want to use drugs that work on serotonin like we had talked about before. And then the last pearl would be to try to avoid drugs that get in the way of that thinking neurotransmitter. Acetylcholine is the one we were sort of alluding to before. Okay. Those are the basic things that we try to do better if we can. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question asking if you could speak more about the stigma related to delirium. Yeah, I, I think that stigma is an acute issue just like the condition itself is for delirium. Like 
often stigma is a long-term major burden for people who struggle with mood problems or psychotic issues or anxiety in the traditional realm of mental illness. For delirium, stigma is more acute. Uh, an example is a 27-year-old guy who um, changes his normal source for getting drugs on the street to some supplier who he didn't meet before, gets some stuff he didn't expect. He also takes a medicine for anxiety. The two interact badly. And he comes into the hospital and just is absolutely tearing up the place out of confusion, toxicity. It's not really at that point his fault at all, but because he made a choice to use a drug and he's a young person who isn't typically in the ICU, sometimes you will see lots and lots of professionals meet that person and want to be as far from that room as they possibly can. Um, another subset of people in the hospital will want that kind of young guy strapped to the bed and having sort of things pointed at him and getting big injections of drugs because he's the problem and there's something wrong with him and who he is and they don't want to have to deal with him. And so stigma can be very sharp when it comes to delirium rather than a, a long-term sort of heavy burden. It can really be an, an acute edge that everyone from nurses to police and security and EMS drivers and all sorts of folks can, can really play a role in if they're not careful. So I think that's where I see delirium being the biggest problem acutely. And then we did allude to before the problem of sort of dismissing people's complaints when they have long-term memories and feelings about delirium that stick with them well after the hospitalization. That's an important thing that we should be better about too. Okay. We've reached the end of our hour here. Um, are there any last words you'd like to give the audience? I know you have previously kind of mentioned some things to take away from it. Um, anything you want to emphasize one more time? You know, I think it's actually one extra thing I'd like to say, and that is that you and I work together in a hospital where a lot of the patients actually don't have many other people in their lives. And so these things we're talking about, about family members and friends being advocates, we don't see that as an option for as many of our patients where we work. And so I'd like to kind of tie this together to the rest of the work you do with this website and this initiative. And that is that we're trying to beat back stigma in other places too. And if we can beat back the stigma of mental illness and other sort of things that make us different and might threaten to separate us from each other, it also has major consequences for us when we have physical illnesses too. Because if we get over the stigma of all of the other mental illnesses that divide us so that we can stay connected as friends and family, then when we do have a major medical problem that might also threaten our brains and get in the way of our recovery, maybe fewer of us would be alone in the hospital when that really important day comes because we will have said, you know, the depression, the anxiety, the other issues, they're not going to keep me from being there at your bedside when you need me the most so that I can help to make decisions for you, defend against these hospital routines that conspire against you. I, I'd like fewer of our patients to be alone when they come to face this problem, if it ever comes. Sure. That's a very important point. And, uh, I think something we could all take from this, you know, whether we're a professional, whether we're, you know, an individual that knows someone who has delirium or that's a, it's a great way to end. Uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, I'd like to remind everyone one more time, April 22nd, uh, please tune in. We'll be at 7.30 Central Time, 8.30 Eastern. Um, and we'll be talking about perineal depression with Barry Mitzman. Um, have a great night, everybody. Thanks.